we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 28 in chapter 5, uh, which I have titled, Ready for the Rapture, because this is what it's about. Remember, I mentioned that the first couple of chapters, chapter 1 and 2 of Thessalonians, is a personal word that Paul has for this church. But chapter 3, 4, and 5, very practical instruction that he gives to this church. You know, I think sometimes we misunderstand what the whole theme of the book is. The theme of the book is, look, Jesus is coming, so get ready. Uh, Jesus is coming, so you better you better be prepared. And the way that Paul says you're prepared is by cooperating with God in the sanctifying work that he wants to do in your life as a believer. He wants to set you apart to himself, and he wants that to be seen in a practical way more and more. In fact, some people think that the spirit-filled life, walking in the spirit, is an impractical life. It's not at all. It's very practical. In fact, when you read verses like this, in which that is about, you see, it's actually where the rubber meets the road, as they say. So 1 Thessalonians closes with a very on a very practical note, and it's simply this. If you believe that Jesus can come back at any moment, then how should you, as a believer, live in light of the rapture? Well, what does that look like, that kind of a life? It's really about your relationships with the Lord and with the church. And that's what these ending verses of chapter 5 are about. It first begins with your relationship with leadership. That's uh, verses 12 and 13, which we will begin with in just a moment, but let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity once again to open your word together. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us very important instruction. You tell us not only what's going to happen in the future, but how we are to conduct ourselves until that point. So we're thankful for that. We pray that you will use our time together this morning to speak to our hearts, change our lives, renew our minds, transform us into your image more and more. Thank you, Lord, for these words that we'll consider this morning. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've already read these verses, but I want you to see verses 12 and 13. A little difficult because, you know, it just so happens that I'm in a position of leadership here. And so I'm kind of talking about myself. But then again, I'm not. <laughs> It's just a a statement regarding how our relationship with church leaders ought to look like. Well, let's see what he says. We beseech you. By the way, to beseech someone in this language is like, look, I'm begging you. Brethren, he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers, brothers and sisters, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Three things there. Your attitude toward and your interaction with leaders in the local church. Three things to note. First of all, he says in that 12th verse, you should know them. You should know your leaders well. It's more than just identifying them. It's recognizing their true value and appreciating the strenuous, wearisome work that they're involved in. And it says, you should know them which labor among you and are over you. The word over there literally means the ones that stand before you or the ones that lead you. You should know your leaders. You should recognize their true value. You should appreciate the the difficulty of their task and uh, recognize that it involves them 
standing before you. I'm standing before you right now. And I'm standing before you. Uh, that's what over you means. I'm standing before you to lead you at this point in the scriptures. And also, he says, and admonish you. And the word admonish means to remind you, to put it in your mind, to put you in mind, to remind you by instruction. Now, I'm certain that not everything that you hear uh, preached is new stuff to you. A lot of it is review. But you know what? That is so important for us as human beings that we hear the same thing over and over again so that it penetrates deeper and deeper into our minds, our hearts, our lives. So my job as a leader is I am to stand before you, I'm to lead you, and I'm to admonish you, I'm to remind you by instruction, and it really is a preventative measure to prevent you, to keep you, from wrongdoing. That's what the word admonish means. So that's what you need to know regarding leadership in the local church. But look at the next verse. And here, you know, uh, I'm a little reticent as a leader to uh, really open this up, but because it applies to me, but you got to understand, I'm going to preach what the text says. I'm going to tell you what the Bible's teaching here. It says in verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Here's the second thing regarding your relationship with leadership in the local church, in this church. Not only to know them, that is, recognize their true value and appreciate their hard work and respond to their leadership and their warning, their admonishing, putting you in mind, instructing you, against wrongdoing, but esteem them. The word esteem there, you need to know this in verse 13, is a word that means a careful, a deliberate consideration so that you can properly value and respect those that are your leaders and to hold them in highest regard is what he's saying, to, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, to hold them in highest regard for, notice, their faithfulness in the work of the Lord, not for their position. You're not to, uh, you're not to properly value and respect them and hold them in highest regard for their position that they're in. No but for their faithfulness to the work of the Lord. That's the basis. And all of that is motivated by your love for the Lord and your love for God's work. How can you do that? What are some practical ways that you can esteem your leaders very highly in love for their work's sake? Well, I'll give you some ideas. You can pray for us. You can pray for your leaders on a regular basis. You can uh, not only pray for us, but you can work with us. You can serve alongside of us. You can serve the Lord with us. And you can encourage us by your support. And, you know, <laughs> there's, there's uh, certain individuals that are very encouraging. Uh, for example... There is an individual that not every time, but quite often, I'm saying like maybe once a month, just stops dead in their tracks, looks me in the eye and says, Pastor, I want to thank you for your work for the Lord. That's what they say. I want to thank you for your work for the Lord. And I know that this person is not just saying that, but that uh, it really comes from their heart. And that's a, a great encouragement. That's one way that you can esteem your leaders, I guess. So know them, esteem them, and then look at verse 13 again, and be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves by leading a faithful, godly life, by laboring together 
with your leaders and taking the ad admonishment that is given and uh, by knowing and esteeming them, share the responsibility to then maintain that peace. One of the greatest necessities in any local church, in our church, <clears throat> is that there maintains a unity of the spirit, a peace among the brothers and sisters, a peace among the leaders and, uh, and the congregation as a whole. It is our joint responsibility, not just the leaders, it's our joint responsibility to protect the peace and unity of this local church and to preserve it as best as we can and to promote church unity. Paul said it this way in another passage. He said that uh, we are to maintain the unity of the spirit, he says, in the bond of peace. Endeavor, he said, be strenuous in your effort to maintain unity of spirit. Remember, I said, your human spirit is joined to Jesus's spirit, and thus our human spirits are joined together with his. So that ought to be spiritual unity right there. And that spiritual unity ought to be preserved. It ought to be promoted. It ought to be protected at all costs. So peace, he says, among yourselves. Then there's a second part in the relationships here in the local church. Not only leadership, but in verses 14 and 15, I call this partnership. A partnership in the congregation. And of course, this is addressed to the whole church. He says, now we exhort you, brethren, that is believers, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We exhort you. We encourage you. Warn them three different types of people, the unruly, the feeble-minded, and the weak. Now, let's talk about them for a moment. First of all, he says in that 14th verse, warn the unruly. Now, the word warn there is the same word that was translated admonish in verse 12, okay? Put them in mind. Uh, give them, remind them by instruction warn or admonish, he calls them the unruly. And the unruly is actually, or in the original language, a military term, and it's, and it's a picture of a soldier that is supposed to be walking in line, keeping rank with the other soldiers around him, but he steps out of line. He's out of rank. And so that's what unruliness is a picture of. It's believers that are living out of order, and they are to be warned. Now, what is he talking about? What kind of disorderliness is he mentioning here? What kind of undisciplined life is he talking about? Well, perhaps it's the same kind of stuff that he's going to talk about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. It's believers that because they are convinced that the rapture will happen at any moment, they are not working. They are idle. They are not, uh, they're, they're neglecting their responsibilities because they expect the rapture to happen uh, soon. And so they quit working in order to be just looking for the rapture. He says that's unruliness. That's undisciplined. That's a neglect of your, that idleness is a neglect of your responsibility. So he says, warn or admonish the unruly, those that are living in a way that is disorderly, that is not in line with what the Bible teaches. Irresponsible. And then again in verse 14, he tells us to comfort or encourage the feeble minded. Now, don't think that that word feeble-minded has to do with someone's intellect. It has nothing to do with that at all. In fact, the word feeble-minded could perhaps be translated small-souled, small-souled. People that are faint-hearted, people that are easily discouraged, 
people that are given to being despondent and despairing. Perhaps in the context of 1 Thessalonians, it's because one of their loved ones died before the rapture, and uh, they felt like there's no hope for them, and so they were discouraged by that. They're, they would be the feeble-minded. Or perhaps someone in the congregation that would feel that they're inadequate, that they are ungifted. They have nothing to offer to the work of the Lord. They have nothing to contribute. They would need to be encouraged. Or perhaps they are someone in the congregation that has fallen into sin and uh, is uh, feeling the reproach of personal sinfulness. Well, you know what needs to happen to a person that is faint-hearted when they are overcome by sin in their life? They need to be encouraged. They need to be helped uh, and encouraged that they can have forgiveness, that if they confess their sin, they can get back up on in uh, back up they can get back on track and walk again in the light feeble minded partnership okay warn the unruly comfort or encourage the feeble minded look at the third thing in verse 14 be pay uh, rather uh, support the weak support the weak now interestingly weak doesn't mean a little strength. It means absolutely no strength. It means to be without strength, period. The weak are people that are without moral or spiritual strengths. What are you supposed to do for them? Notice you're supposed to support them. And the word support is very interesting. It means to hold, literally to hold oneself against, over against another. It, it means that you come along and you you hold them up by sympathetic assistance. You support the weak, those that don't have the moral and spiritual strength that they need for the Christian life. You support them. You hold them up. And then there are three specific attitudes that are required for this kind of partnership. In the last phrase in verse 14, he says this, be patient toward all men. Be patient toward all. Now, the word patient literally is long-tempered. It's the opposite of being short-tempered. It is a willingness to keep on trying to help people, to keep on trying to be a blessing to them. Don't give up on them. And you know, for that to happen, you have to have selfless humility. To be patient to all men requires a selfless humility on our part. Don't give up on them. Be patient toward them. I'm telling you, sometimes uh, it really is difficult to be long-tempered. When uh, people seem to fail the same way over and over again, but we are to be long-tempered toward them not short-tempered. We're supposed to be patient and hold them up by assisting them in a sympathetic way. Here's a second attitude that is required in this partnership. In verse 15, he says, see that none render evil unto any man. Not rendering evil. That is non retaliation. The Th Thessalonian believers had very quickly after being saved suffered persecution. Uh, they were being, maybe they were being hurt and offended by their own family members who weren't saved. I don't know. But uh, whatever the hurt, whatever the persecution, not rendering evil unto any man. It reminds me of Romans 12. Paul deals with that specifically, of not taking vengeance, not being a vigilante, and taking the part of God and, and wreaking uh, vengeance on someone that did you wrong, not paying them back. Those that hurt you, those that persecute you. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. 
Instead of taking vengeance, what does Paul say in Romans 12 we're supposed to do? Instead of retaliating and giving evil for evil, we're supposed to give good for evil. We're supposed to bless those that persecute us, that hurt us, that offend us. We're supposed to pray for them. We're supposed to pray God's blessing upon them. You know, I'm doing that right now for a certain person, not anyone here, but I, a lost person that is just evil and mean and hateful. By God's grace, I am sincerely praying that God will bless that person and that God would do them good. And if there's any way that I can do them good, because that's what Paul says. He says, overcome evil with good. Is there some good that I can do to this person, Lord? Some specific, particular way that I can do them good instead of evil? Show me. And there's a third attitude in verse 15 in this partnership. Not only be patient toward all men, not render evil for evil, but also follow, he says, follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. That is, people outside of the congregation. Follow that which is good. Continue to pursue. You know, like a hunter pursues his prey. Con continue to pursue helpfulness to better the situation for others. That's what this is about. This is what the partnership in the local church demands those kinds of attitudes. You know, you could just sum it up with one word. That is love. That's God's love. That's real love for the brethren and love for those outside of our, uh, our fellowship as well, which leads me to the third thing in this uh, closing portion of this chapter. Beginning in verse 16 down to the end, here's the third area of relationships in a congregation, not only with leadership, not only in partnership, but I call this fellowship. I call this fellowship in a local church. And look at how he begins it in verse 16, rejoice evermore. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. By the way, I think that phrase in verse 18, the second phrase, this is the will of God, I think that phrase applies to the two before that as well and to what comes after it. It's all the will of God. And uh, so he's talking about fellowship in two areas that are involved here. In verses 16 to 24, it's fellowship that we have as a congregation with God's spirit. And I want to look at that for a moment. Because others see our outward lives, but of course we know God sees deeper than that. God sees our heart. God knows our attitude. God sees the real spiritual character of our life. And so what's most important is our fellowship with God's Spirit. In fact, if you don't have fellowship with God's Spirit, you really can't have fellowship in the second area I'll touch on here, and that is with God's people. You got to have fellowship with God's spirit. So I want to ask you a question. What is the Holy Spirit to you? Or who is the Holy Spirit to you? Do you know anything of real, genuine fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Is he just some kind of nebulous force in your life? Grant spoke of the Holy Spirit making our bodies his temple. Okay, we know that we can quote theological truth or Bible truth about the Holy Spirit. We know the Holy Spirit indwells us. We know the Holy Spirit seals us. We know the Holy Spirit ministers. But do you know him as a person? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is not just a force from God, but he is a person? He is the third person of what we call the triune God. He's just as much a person as you are. Even though he doesn't have a human body, he has your human body and he lives in your human body. 
He is just as much a person. You can hurt him. You can grieve him. In fact, if you grieve the spirit, you'll do what he tells us not to do in uh, in the uh, 19th verse. You'll quench the spirit. You'll grieve him, and that will quench the spirit in your life. And so as we begin to think about our fellowship with God's spirit, who is the Holy Spirit to you? And if he is like, forgive me, I'm not trying to offend anyone. If he is like a redheaded stepchild in your life, then you got a problem. You will not, as a Christian, make any progress, real progress, genuine progress, until you have a relationship, you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. I depend upon him all the time. I'm depending upon him right now. And it's vital. So fellowship with God's spirit. You know what? If you have fellowship with the spirit of God, he's going to produce fruit in you. And I believe that's what he's talking about to begin with in verse 16. Uh, he, 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 he's showing us evidence of the inner life of God's spirit. Uh, just a, really three simple yet profound commands. These are commands to rejoice, to pray, to be thankful. They're commands. They're imperatives. These aren't suggestions. These are absolute commands in the original language. And uh, he's telling us to do this. Notice, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything. See those adverbs? I think they're very important that you understand these similar adverbs, always, without ceasing, everything. Let's look at them. Here's the fruit. First one. Verse 16, fruit of the Spirit, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You know what it will produce in your life? Joyfulness. Joyfulness. These people are suffering. These people are suffering real severe persecution. But they are called upon, they're commanded to always be rejoicing. You know why? Because the joy of the Lord is independent of your circumstances. The joy of the Lord has nothing to do with the situation that you find yourself in, no matter how difficult it might be. The joy of the Lord is really the opposite of griping. Rejoicing always is the opposite of griping. It's hope because you have hope for the future. It is uh, really all about faith. You know how you can always rejoice? Because you have faith. You, you're trusting God. You don't know what's going on or why you're suffering this, but you can trust God. And so you can rejoice as a result of that because you know you have hope. This isn't all there is. God has this all under his control. And you can be joyful. Secondly, in verse 17, he says, be prayerful. Not only joyful, but prayerful without ceasing. I thought that this was interesting when I studied this. The words without ceasing in uh, the original language were used to identify a hacking cough. You got a hacking cough? You know what it is, right? I mean, if you have a hacking cough, uh, you have this little tickle in the back of your throat, and you have this tendency to cough even sometimes when you just breathe in a little too much. You have a hacking cough. That's what this praying without ceasing is illustrated by it is it's always there just like a hacking cough is always there prayer is always there in your life it's recurring you never give up praying regardless of your circumstances you're in constant contact with god you're walking in unbroken fellowship with him you're always in touch with him that's what it means to pray without ceasing to stay in touch with the Lord all the time. It doesn't mean you're always praying, but it means you're always in contact with the Lord. Pray without ceasing. And then here's another of the fruit of fellowship with God's spirit. 
he says in verse 18, in everything give thanks. Notice the wording there. Notice the preparate, uh, the, the prepositions there. He, he doesn't say give thanks for everything, but he says give thanks in everything. And that's a big difference. In all your circumstances, you are to give thanks in the midst of them. And in doing so, you are yielding your will to God. You're saying, God, I don't know why this is happening, but I, I can thank you because I know that you didn't make a mistake. I can thank you because I know you're not trying to hurt me. You yield to God's will. And then there is fellowship with God's spirit not only produces fruit, but it has to do with his ministry. And so pick that up in verse 19. He says, quench not the spirit. There's This section really is a list of do's and don'ts that pertain to the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. And the first don't is don't quench the spirit. And it's in a present tense, and it means stop doing it. You're already doing it. Stop doing it. Stop extinguishing. To quench is to put out a fire or to extinguish a fire. Stop extinguishing or stifling the spirit of God's ministry in your life or in the congregation. How do you do that? Well, by ignoring perhaps his presence, not having fellowship with him, ignoring his presence, or suppressing or even rejecting his nudging in your life. You can stifle the spirit just by dampening fervor, by having a critical attitude, or perhaps just a mechanical kind of worship. It's not real, true from your heart. You're going through the motions. You can quench the spirit. You can stifle the spirit of God and extinguish his ministry by tolerating false doctrine or by to tolerating immorality in your life or in the life of the church, or by yielding to any sinful or selfish way in your life, you can extinguish the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't force himself on us. He's a perfect gentleman. The Spirit of God will only work as you acknowledge him and desire him and fellowship with him. He'll minister to you. So quench not the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, despise not prophesying. That is, stop doing it. It's present tense again. Stop treating the supernatural Holy Spirit revealed truth with contempt. Stop reducing it as if it's nothing. And I think in the context, perhaps he's referring to the truth that the Holy Spirit revealed through Paul here to, the, to this congregation of the rapture. Stop treating it with contempt. Believe it. Uh, rejoice in it. Despise not. I have no desire to uh, redefine what prophesyings are outside of what the Bible says they are. It's not my, that's not my task. That's not what I want to do. Whatever that is. We're not to we're not to uh, to despise it. We're not to have contempt for it. The, here's the bottom line: the Bible is supreme. All prophesyings have to be sifted through the grid of the Word of God. All has to line up with the Bible, and if it doesn't, well, that's what he says in the verses that follow, verse twenty-one. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. What's he talking about? Well, in the context, he's talking about prophesying. The ministry of the Holy Spirit and prophesying, he says, you got to put them to the test. You don't believe everything that someone says, God, uh, this is God's word. This is God's, uh, that God gave me this prophecy. You have to examine it for biblical genuineness. And if it's biblically sound, then you hold on to it. If it passes that test, you have to have really the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift is the discerning of spirits, because not all prophecy is from the Holy Spirit. 
That's why you need to test the spirits, John says in 1 John 4. Test the spirits to see whether they be of God. You have to examine the prophecy to see if it is genuinely a Holy Spirit given prophecy. And if it passes the test, cling to it is what he's saying here in verse 21. And verse 22, if you discern its error, reject it. Hold off from it. Stay away from all that looks wicked. All that looks evil is the context here. And then uh, verses 23 and 24 Here's another ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. And really, this is what the book's about. And that is, he sanctifies. It says, and the very, here's Paul's prayer, actually, for the people. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly or entirely. I pray, God, your whole, your entire spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. That is, without the ability to be censored. We be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the coming again. <laughs> he keeps talking about it. He says, uh, sanctify you. That is, set you apart to God. Set you apart to God. Sanctify you wholly. This is the entire intended goal or aim of God's salvation. That your three-part human being would be sanctified. And uh, he says, your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, I don't want to argue, but I'm sorry. I believe in what is called man being tripartite, man being three parts. And I see it here, spirit, soul, and body. Paul says in or, or whoever wrote Hebrews, in, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, he says that uh, the, the word of God has the ability to separate between soul and spirit. So they're two distinct, two distinct parts of a human being. I believe that the spirit of, of human beings has the ability to communicate with God, to have fellowship with God. I believe that when it's regenerated, of course, when it's regenerated. And secondly, I believe that the soul of human beings is uh, a self-consciousness and our ability to have relationships with other human beings. And I think that, of course, the body is the material part in which the spirit and the soul reside. I also believe this. I believe that when you get saved... And the Holy Spirit of God moves into your body and you become a partaker of the divine nature that that part of you that the Holy Spirit dwells in is your human spirit. Your old man, your old unregenerated spirit is dead and buried and you're given a new human spirit that is alive to God and with God in it. And because of that, I believe that your spirit is 100% saved and preserved for eternity. I believe that during this lifetime on this earth, God is seeking to, as in your believing life, he's seeking to sanctify your soul. Your soul is your mind. Your soul is your affections. Your soul is your will. And he is seeking to save your soul during this time in your earthly life. And when Jesus comes, as we've been talking about at the rapture, at that moment when we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, then our bodies, our bodies will be saved. They will be glorified. So with that un understanding, when we look at verse 23, I think one of the reasons why he brings up the, the, I think the order is significant. One of the reasons why he lists the spirit first is because it's already sanctified. It's already preserved. And God is saying that Paul is praying, I want your soul and your body to be sanctified like your spirit is. Well, is that going to happen? 
Look at verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. The Holy Spirit's ministry, he's going to get it done. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. It is that, you know, I don't fault them for doing this, but it's taken out of context. Missionaries often use that uh, 24th verse saying, God called me to missions, and so he's going he's gonna to do it on the mission field through me. Okay, that's true, but that's not the context here. The context is God that saved you is going to sanctify you, not only spirit, but also soul and body. You can rest assured it's going to happen. That's what we should see here. And then he says uh, that we not only have fellowship with God's spirit, but verses 25 to 28, we have fellowship with God's people, us. How important is the church to you? How important is the fellowship of your brothers and sisters in the Lord to you? Is it all right just to forget about church for a month? <laughs> is it all right just to forget about it week on uh, week after week? How important is God's church to you? He says, brethren, pray for us. You see, prayer is needed. Prayer for God to do his work in us and through us. Verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I think what he's saying there is we're to love the brethren. We're to love one another. It's not talking about smooching. It's talking about loving the brothers and sisters in the Lord. The oriental way of kissing, you know, when you greet on one cheek and the other, right? That's what it's talking about. And it was women kissing women that way and men kissing men that way, all right? I don't like to be kissed by a man anyway. But <laughs> it doesn't have to happen. Like what he's saying here is love the brethren. Love your brothers and sisters. This is what fellowship is about. And you know what? When I'm away from my brothers and sisters, I can't wait to get back together with them. I don't like being away from them. So there, that is just the way it's supposed to be. And then look at what he says in that 27th verse. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle, this letter, this book of First Corinthians or First Thessalonians, be read unto all the holy brethren. Be read in the church, you might say. And so here's the third thing that really uh, solidifies. I should say, the unity and the testimony of the local church is not only their, their, their praying for one another, the love for one another, but the vital importance of the word of God being read and letting then that Bible be your guide and govern your life. What good is it if we come here and we hear a message or if we at home read our Bible and then just go off and do what we want to do? Live the way we want to live. Forget by being forgetful hearers. What a self-deception that is. No, the Bible is vitally important that we read it publicly, that we read it privately, and that we then apply it by allowing it to guide us and govern our lives. You know, the chapter that we're in is just teaching us how to be ready for the rapture. You know how? <laughs> You just cooperate with God's sanctifying work in your life through the ministry and the fellowship of Bible-believing people and Bible-preaching local church. You know, the local church has fallen on tough times. There's a lot of negative perceptions about the, the church, and some of it is the church's fault. Stories of abuse by uh, pastors and and greed uh, have tarnished, of course, the testimony of the church. Many outside the local church think that church is more concerned with buildings and, uh, and budgets and nickels and noses than they are people and their problems. The people ought to be the thing that the church is really concentrated on. There are many today that 
don't think that the church is relevant any longer. Local church is passe. Not just people outside of the church, but I'm finding that there are young people in the church that don't think that the church is really relevant anymore. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't do for them what I guess they think it should do for them. In fact, George Barna, a Christian pollster, he's written a large number of American Christians and said that they're disillusioned with the church. He says he supports this trend, and he's labeled uh, these church dropouts revolutionaries who are on the verge of forcing a decline of churches in this century. And amazing, many professing Christians see themselves as, as part of a huge, uh, invisible, universal church, which I believe is, it exists, but they don't participate in the local church. But while many have given up on the local church, I'm glad to say Jesus hasn't. Our Lord hasn't. The church is still the center of God's work in this world and always will be until Jesus raptures us. And if you are going to have a right relationship with the Lord, you'll have to have a right relationship with his church, just the way it is. You can't live it. You can't live for him. You can't please him without fellowship with God's people in a local church. So I think that's why you're here. And I hope that it will increase your appreciation for the leadership, for the partnership, and for the fellowship that we share. This is how to be ready for the rapture. 